I think that what drives seniority, even in software engineering or just like pure DevOps, is that you can distinguish between hype tech and useful tech. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 263, Navigating the Complex Path to Becoming a DevOps Architect. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your host, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, many times we've talked about getting started in DevOps. We've talked about why you might want to be a DevOps person or why you might not want to be a DevOps person. But let's assume that's all done. And now you've decided you wanted to be a DevOps architect. Oh, architect. Okay. It's getting interesting. How do you define a DevOps architect? I define it as a person who spent significant amount of time being uh, a developer and then switched to be an ops person. And then after that became DevOps something. And then after enough experience with all three of those, decided to be an architect and think of the whole system. And now probably there are three people altogether that feel that description. That exist on the planet today. Well, fortunately, we have one of those people on with us today. And I'm going to say his name incorrectly, and then he will say his name correctly. Adam, how are you doing today? Thanks, I'm good. And I'm Adam. So, But Adam is fine, absolutely. Okay, I did not notice the difference. <laughs> it's a closed A. It's not ah, A, okay. but A. Adam. Yeah. Oh, okay. See, I'm learning things already today from an actual DevOps architect. Actually, there is a story I didn't confirm with that if you didn't learn certain sounds when you were relatively young, you cannot pronounce them or even very often notice the difference. Yeah, this is supposedly true, but I'm not a linguist, so I can be wrong as well. Adam is a day-to-day DevOps architect. Tell us, what does a day... Okay, let's rewind there for a second. Was Victor's explanation of being a dev and then moving to ops, and then at some point something renamed, and then you've worked up... Does that follow your timeline at all, or is yours completely different? Uh, Slightly different, I would say. So basically, I started my career more about processing data, and creating like business intelligence, software, tooling, basically reports for other people. But obviously that required programming, it required knowledge of databases, data warehouse, ETL processes, and things like that. How I became closer to DevOps is when I switched jobs and we were working on an IoT project. It was collecting a ton of data and we had to make it scalable at the end. And we were already running in Kubernetes back then like 1.9 with running on AWS with COPS. There wasn't an EKS back then. So it was an interesting challenge. And basically I had to learn about Kubernetes and how to do the stuff that we do and then make actually a scalable architecture out of that. So this is how I kind of got engaged after developing some code with the ops side of the things. And then I continued to pursue that further in my career. That's nice. That means that you jumped in before things became easy, right? Before EKS and what's or not with COPS, right? Yeah. And uh, if I remember correctly, the deployment that currently everybody's using wasn't even a thing or it was just a beta thing. And we were having to use replication sets or replica sets. Oh, that's really early. Yeah. Very cool. 
So instead of coming through what we would call, quote unquote, a pure developer, you came in through the data path. Yes. Which is similar to my story because I was all data back in the 80s and then moved into Sybase, Microsoft SQL Server, and finally other things happened and you know, now I do this thing, which I don't even know what this is anymore. So that seems like a check mark to me, what Victor was saying, because data is development. I will never question that point. Yeah, and actually before that IoT job, I was actually writing Python code for a distributed data calculation pipeline. The platform was IBM Symphony Grid. Probably not many companies use that, but we actually used it for distributing like in a thousand thread, the data calculation coming from the data warehouse data. So we actually automated that fully audited process to calculate some metrics. So this is, so I had programming experience actually, not just like, I don't know, click, click, click in Tableau. I don't like Tableau on the other side. I don't know too many people that do. One other thing Victor said is it took experience. So let's rewind back to your beginning times to now. How many years is that? Now it's actually more than 10. More than 10 years. Yeah, I think it should be 12-ish. Now, do you feel like you are confident today in what you do as an architect? Depending on the topic, basically, because to be honest, so the current company I work at is a SaaS company, so we don't sell software, we sell service. We have B2C and B2B customers, and the company has around 1,000 employees, 300 engineers, and we have tens of millions of customers and thousands of companies. Some of them is quite big, and you probably know them. They have tens of thousands of users for them onboarded to the platform. So it's quite a decent sized company. So obviously that has a lot of diverse set of technologies, and obviously it has histories uh, with that, and it doesn't make our job easier. Even if we are focusing on like AWS, we still run like EC2s, we still run Kubernetes, we run Fargate, we have a few Lambdas. So it's all over the place. So and AWS is even in, in itself is too complex to actually have, I think, a broad understanding of all the services in detail. So it's every day a kind of a learning opportunity for me. And we haven't talked about all the other stuff that we are responsible for besides just running the infrastructure. That's one of the ways how you can distinguish somebody with real experience in AWS and without, right? If, if a person says, I know AWS, that person has no idea, right? I don't think that there is a single person in AWS itself who knows all AWS. It's simply impossible. There are close to thousand endpoints, I think. I mean, even the IEM stuff that AWS has now, you can see IEM engineers uh, as a job posting because it's so complex that to make a proper role, it's very hard to do. So even for your company, Victor Crossplane, in the docs, I think they still mention when you deploy Crossplane, you should assign administrator access because that it won't break anything. But obviously it's not production ready and everybody knows that, but for trial purposes, it's okay. But if you leave it like that in production, that's a recipe for disaster. Why would you not want to give full administrator privileges just out to let things happen? I, I don't understand. That just don't do that in production people. That's the key part there. So mentioning there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback on what Victor just said. And this is what you said is AWS is too complex. I mean, every hyperscaler to one degree or another is too complex, right? Just that AWS is... Whatever is the complexity of other providers or hyperscalers, then you multiply it by some number. Yeah, so I, I think that even the simple things in AWS is quite complex. So I think that Corey one time did some digging and it's like 200 microservices behind S3, which is just an object store. So it should be simple because it's just store files, but somehow they ended up with hundreds of different services for that. So maybe it's not simple after all. Well, it is simple for us using it. It's just not simple for the operation of it. And I'm thankful that I'm not operating it. It's not even simple for us using it. There is no single useful resource in AWS that you can create alone. You cannot just say, I want to run EC2 instance, right? You cannot just say, I want to run EKS. You need to combine it with the 
with a number of other services for something to work, right? So it's not even simple for the end users. And back to my IEM analogy, if you start an EC2, then you already have to choose which way you want to authenticate with AWS services. If you create an access key, then probably you are doing something wrong. If you are using instance profile, then you can have surprises, especially if you use IMDS v2. And then it's just getting more complex from that. So th this is a really tricky stuff, basically, at the end. So EC2, again, is not easy. And we haven't talked about like, okay, EC2 as Linux or Windows, or maybe now Metal uh, or Max. So which one you actually want to run? Well, which one do you want to run? I mean... I don't want to run Windows. Unfortunately, we have to, but luckily not in production, but uh, I don't want to run Windows ever. Are you that biased against Windows? It's not that bad of an operating system. No, but uh, you have to, I think to be a good Windows person, you have to know PowerShell and PowerShell is not my forte. Uh, let's put it that way. Let's face it, almost nobody runs Windows without being, these days, without being forced to, right? Most of the companies I work with, they would gladly switch to Linux if they could, as servers, right? I'm not talking about laptops right now. It's just that, yeah, you have some .NET applications or you invested too much to do it, but it's nobody's choice anymore for a server. I don't think so either. I mean, even Microsoft is offering MS SQL on Linux for a reason, so. When Microsoft did exactly that, offering SQL Server on Linux. That was like, oh, I mean, it's Windows is still bringing in lots of money for them, but some things are just better run on Linux. That's, I believe, what made Microsoft come back among living, right, from the disaster they were years ago. So they recognized that, okay, so the world is not turning only and exclusively around Windows, right? We're going to make something called Azure that can run whatever people want, and we're going to make our applications work in other, other operating systems and so on and so forth. That's the, that was the pivotal mo moment from Balmer era to, to where we are today, right? But to answer your question, Darren, if you run, want to run Windows, then probably don't try to run it on AWS. It's not easy. And Azure has all the nice uh, whistles and bells to do it. And if you choose AWS, then you have to invest a lot of time to make it happen what Microsoft already did, and you will probably still end up uh, with a worse result at the end. Here's a question, and I agree that running Windows in AWS is not the best option. But on the other hand, if you're already having everything else in AWS, is Windows in AWS worse option than the problems you will have by running something here, something there? This is a Good questions. So for example, running a Windows server is kind of okay. You can, you don't have to buy licenses, AWS provided for you, obviously for a price. But if you like want to run like MS SQL database, there is managed RDS, but, and it works, obviously it's managed service until you want to run it in a single region. Once you want to do a multi-region MS SQL database, then you basically have to make compromises how you want to like disaster recovery, switch over, or if you want to run yourself the uh, log replication and you have to do it basically unmanaged way most almost at the end. So, and again, this is in Azure, it's not that big of a deal because Microsoft already does it for you, but AWS doesn't make multi-region MS SQL an easy decision to make. Well, to me, that makes it an easy decision to not use it in AWS as an architect. Yeah, if you have that choice. Well, I would hope as either an architect or the architect in a company, I would be able to have that choice. So are you telling me that the architects don't have the final say? Ignoring budget for a moment, because budget is sort of a, you have to factor it in, but it's usually not the only thing. But the budget is where it becomes complicated, right? Because all hyperscalers are going to give you special deal if you go bigger. 
right? You're very much incentivized to put more into one Skype scaler than less because then you get the price, right? Yeah, obviously, if you're an enterprise, then you are going for AWS for enterprise support, which is obviously already costing. And then your procurement team will make sure that you get a decent enterprise discount pricing. If you are having some patterns like, I don't know, like Zoom does with the video conferencing, then you can get further discounts if you commit to a certain spend on like outbound traffic. So you can get nice discounts on this type of stuff if you have something very specific use case that is outside of the normal pattern at the end. Architects obviously has decisions to make, but also we not run the company, we collaborate with other teams like security. And if security want to make sure that they have everything in a single pane of glass and we don't spread around, then it probably sometimes makes sense to suffer some of these inconveniences like MS SQL or Windows servers in AWS because at the end you still have to hire people and they still have to be expert. And as we already agreed, nobody's an AWS expert. They can be good with a couple of services. But if you are starting to expand your scope that like you have to run with your team AWS and then Azure and maybe Kubernetes is better in GCP, or you want to run containers, then not Fargate, but Cloud Runs. So you can always find a better service in, in one of the other places, but it makes your environment fully fragmented. It does make it fragmented, but does it make it more reliable? I don't think so. I, I think that multi-cloud sounds good on paper, but until you can prove that you can actually do multi-cloud, it doesn't exist. And to be honest, for us, stuff to move to any other cloud, it would probably take months, maybe a year, more than a year, even if we are fully in cloud and nothing runs on premises. It's simply, you are so embedded there. Even just like if I look into our S3 bucket sizes, there are terabytes of data in it. You have to move that to like blob storage or Google Cloud storage that's a significant expense just to move the data and you haven't invested any of the engineering time to actually change the code, change the libraries, change the interaction model, change the permissions. Yeah, the actual move of data from one blob store to another, I'm going to say it's simple, but it's all the other stuff, like you were just mentioning, changing the apps, doing all the other things that people may not be factoring in, where it becomes extremely hard. Maybe that's what happens when we've done this enough years that we look at, it's like, oh, this is easy. I could do it this weekend. But yeah, that this weekend turns into another year of work. That's kind of why, at least in my case, most of the successful multi-cloud setups I've seen didn't does not come or did not come from company wanting to be multi-cloud, but being forced to be multi-cloud in terms of, hey, we just acquired this company. This We run in AWS, this company runs in Google Cloud. And it's not even that we want to be multi-cloud, but the cost of moving them to us is just so high. And when I say cost, I don't mean cost that hyperscalers charge you, but of all the effort you need to put into it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, any decent-sized company that spends in the seven figures per year they have so many services and so many code that even if they are run in fully on top of Kubernetes, that's a pain because if you didn't change like the CNI at the first place, like from AWS CNI to like, I don't know, to Cilium or something else, then you probably already have a feature disparity between two Kubernetes clusters. And as soon as you try to leverage the cloud for the many solutions, like, I don't know, Aurora, you will find that this will work again differently in other places and not talk about even just even more deeper integration like if you are want to do like service mesh aws style then you can use vpc lattice but that would be basically lock you in almost forever because getting rid of something that is fully proprietary is almost impossible most of the time or too much effort and it doesn't work the cost i feel that that's the important question, how do you distinguish services that bring you 
enough value, but do not lock you in from other two extremes, right? Companies sometimes go crazy and say, we are going to do everything AWS way, or the other extreme of, we're not going to use anything from AWS, which is equally silly. So I feel that there is a fine art of trying to distinguish what makes sense to use from your provider and when you should go for something else like Cilium CNI, right? Yeah, this, this is always a discussion with the business. In our case, if we want to onboard any like third party vendors, so let's say we want to replace our Aurora with Planet Scale because they are now the cool guys in the market, then I have to go to procurement. I have to onboard the vendor, check their certificates, like if they have like a SOC 2. If they don't, then probably it's already off the table and then figure out how much it would cost, price it, price it the project, put it into the team's agenda, figure out if we even have the bandwidth to do such a migration. And then we can decide that if we want to bury the cost of doing this, because it's worth for a business reason, even if maybe nominally it would cost the same. And obviously the work time is also something that is, doesn't appear on the books directly, but you have to account for that. And then you run the project, you still have to do the legal team discussions, especially if you have your, they have your data because then they will want to have a DPA. They want to have liability for them because if they got a breach and they expose your data, then ultimately it will hit you. Obviously it hit, will hit them, but your company's data is owned by another team at the end. So in AWS, comparing to like the other hyperscalers like Azure, so far they had much less breaches. So if you decide that you choose like a slightly less cool tech, you can still probably count that they won't get breached. So your data will be safe. And sometimes it's worth the trade-offs. So this is all not just an engineering decision, but also a business decision at the end. That whole storyline that you went through, starting with procurement, onboarding the vendor, making the decisions of, okay, what do we have to do here with legal? What are these things? That tells me you've been in this rodeo a while. It tells me that you've probably felt every one of these points painfully in what you're doing. But then you get down to the end of what you were saying there, and you were saying, sometimes we don't need cool tech. Isn't that true all the time? Shouldn't we try to stay away from the cool tech for as long as possible until it's boring? I think that what drives seniority, even in software engineering or just like pure DevOps is that you can distinguish between hype tech and useful tech. I mean, there is always some kind of wave that now you should do AI. I don't know, two years ago, you should have done GitOps. I don't know next year what will be. But at the end, you have to be able to decide that if it works for you or not. If you are an early adopter, do you have the capacity and the patience to suffer all the immaturity issues and you have to figure out your own? There is no established patterns. Like even GitOps is a thing for like, I don't know, I'm doing it for like probably four years now. We st I st still haven't seen like a, a good pattern. Everybody does that what works for basically their SDLC flow because at the end, all company release stuff differently. They have different expectations and you have to design the solutions for the people who, who you work with and not for your own kind of enjoyment because it sounds like fun. And even then, when you do choose to jump into something relatively new, because your experience, you see the benefits, let's say containers, right? Back in the day, there is still that challenge of what will prevail, right? What will stay? There are competitors and most of them will disappear, right? If we go years back in time, when you were using COPS, I'm not sure when exactly that was, right? But that could have been in a period where we were all confused. Will it be Mesos? Will it be Kubernetes? Will it be Swarm? Will it be Nomad, right? 
And there was like, just in that simple example, there was 75% chance that you would fail, right? That you would make a wrong bet. Yeah, and actually back then when you selected like, let's create an a AKS cluster in uh, Azure, you could choose DCOS or Mesos, not just Kubernetes. There was an actual choice. Exactly. You have to make a bet like either Google wins or maybe Apache wins, who knows? At the end, Google win, but you, you could not know back then. So you have to make a leap of faith. And obviously, and, and even if it wasn't like an offered solution, like you still had like Docker Swarm, you still had like Docker Compose. Okay, maybe we just use Docker Compose or we can just stick with pure system D and, and let's have immutable VMs and like build it with Packer and then dub deploy it. And you can scale it up with EC2 and it would be fine. At least it would be a familiar workflow for your team because they are the SSH into machines so they can at least troubleshoot it easily. For Kubernetes, troubleshooting was like, okay, what the heck I can do with it? Locks, maybe? I'll make a small correction to what you said. Google didn't win. AWS won. If there is a company who benefited from Kubernetes, that's AWS before anybody else. There are so many, I don't remember the exact data, but I was looking at some stats and the number of EKS clusters and nodes in EKS clusters around the world is so much bigger than GK. So much bigger. Yeah, because to be honest, who spends the most money is probably enterprises. And enterprises doesn't like Google because the APIs are easily broken. Now they try to have guarantees around that, but... It's Google at the end, so you don't have the trust as an enterprise in them. Also, at the end, we went through all of the cloud support with this company, and AWS is far, far ahead of everybody else. Their technical account managers and their tech support and the tickets, they resolve it fast. They route it to people who actually will be able to help you. They investigate your issues. They are reactive. For the other two, they are much behind, lagging behind. And that many times really matters, especially if you have some production issues and they never told us that we were wrong. Even if we misconfigured something, they were helpful, analyze the logs, getting back audit events and things like that, and help us to figure out what didn't work at the end. So let's go back to the top of the episode. What is a, I wasn't going to say a day in the life of you look like, but let's broaden it a little bit and let's say a week in the life because a day can probably be very different Monday through Friday, but your Monday through Fridays are probably very similar. Is that a true or false statement? They have some similar patterns. So, I mean, I usually sync with my peer. I'm not the only DevOps architect within the company. Basically, there is two of us. This is responsible for most of our services, not all of our services, obviously, because it's just too broad. We have in a pair for a while and we sync basically every day because we try to split up the projects. Sometimes we work together on a project, but obviously cannot be everywhere. And we still have too many meetings, I think, at the end. And then if I have time and I don't have any conflict, I usually try to attend our team's stand up. So I'm up to speed what they are doing, what they are working on. And if they have any challenges, then usually we can give them, uh, let's say, quick guidance and we can discuss if they need further help. Most, not most of my time, but a significant portion of my time is actually trying to help them to learn, mentoring them, figuring out solutions together if there is a technical problem. Obviously, I won't assist like, okay, this is how you release, but if you stuck with a uh, a technical issue, then we try to unblock them or either by like doing live coding or just trying to give them guidance on what they should try to look into or actually looking into and pointing them to the exact issue that they are facing. And obviously a lot of meetings with our engineering peers, other architects that is responsible for the software part of the product. And obviously, as we discussed about, sometimes we propose new things. And that should be probably one of the architect's responsibility at the end that we try to design solutions that will be scalable, that will be maintainable, and 
that could be implemented by the teams. And sometimes we take a leap of faith that we see something new that we don't have experience with. And my preference is that I don't like to throw people under the bus. So, okay, I figured this out. This would be cool. So you should do it. I'd rather try to do like a POC, uh, a decent POC, not production quality POC, but a decent POC that is helping to understand if what we thought is actually possible or not at the end. And yeah, this is basically most of my time, but as my colleague liked to say that the architect ID is PowerPoint. I was going to say Visio, but okay, PowerPoint. I want to call back a couple of those items. Too many meetings, figuring out something, working with, with people, and then you said too many meetings again. In a week, how many hours out of a 40, 50 hour week do you think you spend in meetings? Depending on the week. In a good week, it's probably less than 30%. In a normal week, probably 50%. And in a bad week, probably over 80 Well, somebody has to do it, I guess, right? Depends really on the meetings themselves. I kind of changed my opinion on meetings. I feel that when you're senior and your job is more to guide people than do it everything yourself, then meetings start making a bit more sense. Assuming that they're constructive, right? And about making decisions, about helping people. Those are meetings as well, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So many times we help figure out, not like our direct teams, but peer teams that, okay, they want to do something new in AWS. So we give them advice. We don't support mostly their implementation. We don't do code review for them, but we help them to understand what is the possibilities. We want to understand their business problem. I want to propose a solution that fits into our security stance because ultimately people usually figure out the solution themselves. I don't think that's a problem with, with engineers and, so, uh, and most of the time with any company. The issue usually that the lack of experience with AWS results in a solution that usually doesn't meet our security requirements at the end. And we are very strict about some of this stuff that what you can do or what you cannot do so for example in the whole aws organization the creating iem users is prohibited it's actually denied you cannot even if you have admin access on the account you cannot create an iem user i imagine somebody has to be able to create an iem user yeah our s cloud admins can create iem users but we don't it's just for basically less result at the end. So some tools that other teams purchase require IAM users. And if we have IAM users, then we actually had to fight for compliance requests to have an exception. And the team had to go through that. And they have, I think, half a year or quarterly reviews if they still need that. And we actually have a Lambda that is rotating the IAM user access key every 30 days and they have to change it constantly. And the scope of the IAM user, they cannot assign any role to that. It's also maintained by us and it's basically having altogether two specified actions at the end. So it's, we have one, but it's basically useless and it's scoped to like VPC endpoint and other stuff. So basically it's, even if you can copy the access key, you cannot use it from your machine. That's the key point that I wanted somebody to say, and I'm glad you explained it very well there. I'm not saying IM users are bad. I, I don't think they are, but can they be used for bad things? Yes. But if you listen back to the story that he just told, security has to get involved. You have to get compliance involved to get an exception. You have to blah, 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 blah. At some point, you're going to reach back to that business team that bought that software and say, look, you can't put that here. We can't use that here. And of course, then you start a whole nother set of fights in that scenario. Yeah. So sometimes you have to go through these fights. So if you are free strongly about this, you probably should raise it. Anytime you have a concern regarding what level you are on, you should raise it because better be a false positive than something that you actually kept to yourself and actually end up 
in in the worst situation at the end. So I think that raising these issues is always good to your manager, to your architect, to, I don't know, seniors, because you at least understand what was the reason behind it. At the end, maybe it was just a false positive, but you, you do your best and you probably learn something on the way as well. Have you ever been in a scenario where you're meeting with a team and they're laying out what they're wanting to do? So this is a greenfield project, and or at least a greenfield from your perspective, and they are stating all the things that they need, and then all of a sudden you're just sitting there going, well, this other team over here already is doing this. Has that ever happened to you in, in your scenarios? We start new projects, obviously. So s- sometimes they already have a fully designed solution, proposals for everything. They just want to have a review. And sometimes we ask them that what is the actual you want to solve. I usually don't want to interfere with anybody's plans, especially if they are well established and many times they do the their homework. But if there is a simplification option, which would lower the maintenance cost at the end, then usually we highlight those. For example, if you can replace something with a managed service, or if you are creating too complex environment, which cannot be maintained, or if we have almost the same, but we actually have release processes for that, and you, your would be a one-off problem, then probably we try to steer them into that direction. But If it's not to our core responsibilities, we won't block anybody at the end. Let me present a scenario for you. I am working on a brand new monolithic Java or Go web application. doesn't matter. It's going to be in a container image. I'm coming to you for approval. I've already mapped all this out. It's going to be a single container image. I don't need replication. I don't need anything else like that. Just running a specific one. And I've also presented to you that I need actually multi-region EKS because I actually need to build out my CV to be able to tell other people that I know how to run EKS. So I've presented, here's a single image that I'm going to be deploying and it's going to be running in a single place in a multi-region cluster. Are you going to deny me that option? No, but I would ask you questions probably. Like uh, what, I mean, usually it's not the problem. So if you have like a container image, doesn't matter what it runs basically at the end, it can run. If it's stateless, then it's easy to scale most of the time, but none of the real world application is stateless. So at the end you have a stateful application which access data somewhere. And this would be the first question that where it's getting that data from because running containers in multi-region is easy. Running databases multi-region is hard and sometimes very difficult. Also, you have to be aware that what would be the scalability issue at the end, because auto-scaling sounds always fun, but you have to have the metrics for that. You have to have the monitoring for that and you will have a bottleneck somewhere in the pipeline. So some service won't scale further. And that will be the kind of the crash of the application at the end. Even if the Java code runs fine, your DB might not. Or it still runs, but you cannot accept more connection because the connection pool is full. And then it's basically unfunctional at the end. So what you're telling me is, I can do it if I want to, but I'm also on the hook for the budget for all this. And probably the database server that's running underneath my desk isn't going to work out. Yeah, exactly. And if it's running under your desk, then we already have an issue because as I mentioned, we standardize a lot of things. So for example, we run most of the stuff based on like well architected design and we have like a centralized network account and that network accounts creates how we call it the super network between the accounts with transit gateways and that transit gateways route everything basically, but again, so if you want to do like a VPN or VPC peering, then you cannot do that. So VPC peering is again, banned across the infrastructure. So you cannot just do that. If you create VPCs for yourself, then you can obviously peer it, but then you'd lose the 
connectivity between the accounts fully. So you basically isolating yourself away from the rest of the company. What advice would you give to people that are wanting to get to the point to where you're at now? I'm assuming maybe stay at a company for a while to actually go through all these things. Maybe don't job hop. What's your advice of maybe and, and the person that we're talking to is the person that's either right out of college or in their first two years. So I think ultimately how you can get to a point where you can be a good, at least according to my ex expectation and standards, a good architect regarding what you do is if you try to do everything the right way. And I'm not saying that the good way, the right way. So sometimes doing boring stuff, basically in a DevOps world, what you can do the right way is to automate it. It doesn't matter if it's Jenkins, Ansible, or Terraform, or Crossplane. At the end, you should be automate your job because that will help you to focus on new stuff. And if you keep doing the same stuff every day, then you probably won't learn much. You need time for that. And everybody has limited amount of time, especially in work. So the best way to do more is to do less what you already does. And that will help you to grow. How to get to a point where you actually be, I don't know, principal or architect. I don't think that will happen by your side. Seen and interviewed many sysadmins, turned to DevOps or rebranded to DevOps, spent, I don't know, 15 years in his career, and they don't have a broad experience because they always did the same thing. So in the cloud environment, you cannot do that. You have to learn and you have to do stuff. To be a successful architect, it's not about just the technical capabilities, I think. It's about how you can influence others. And influencing doesn't mean like doing a hippo, that you are the biggest turner, but you actually can convince people that your idea is worthy. And for that, you don't have to be an architect. You don't have to be senior. You have to be able to communicate clearly, precisely, sell the idea, have the questions answered that you will be asked why you are doing this. And if you can do that right now, then probably you have a good chance to become a good architect because at the end, whenever we propose something new, we have to sell it to the business. Uh, we have to get the budget for that. We have to get the buy-in and we have to deprioritize some other project because there is always a backlog and there is always the backlog is bigger than how many people you can hire. So at the end, you have to be able to convince people that whatever you want to do is worth more than whatever we already know we wanted to do. I like the part you said earlier about automation, because not necessarily only automation, but especially bigger companies are, at least in my experience, always going to push you towards becoming an expert in a specific thing, right? You are indispensable. You're the one who knows DB2, right? Nobody else knows it. It needs to be you. So I feel that very often it is up to us to actually find ways to go outside of knowing in depth one thing and only one thing, right? Not that there is anything wrong with it, but if that's the goal, if, if you want to go further than that, then it's more often up to you and I see too many people expecting that the company itself is going to provide me the means to expand. While in reality, companies are really, you are very helpful to companies being specialized, deeply specialized in one thing. Exactly. You can be an expert. We have those people and I fully appreciate their deep knowledge about what they are expert in. But if you want to do DevOps, you cannot be a Jenkins expert. You have to be more than that. You have to be able to build containers, build infrastructure, do infrastructure as code with Terraform, Crossplane, I don't know, CDK, CloudFormation, whatever you choose. But you have to be able to learn and read the docs. Most of the time, people forget to read the docs because most of the time, actually, documentation has the answers for their problems. They just forget to check it. And this is what, in this case, you be able to do because... There is always will be 
what wherever you go there will be new tools and you have to learn them so if you don't want to learn then probably don't choose devops as your career path there is also the other extreme i very often get questions from type of people that darin mentioned i'm finishing my studies i want to be devops i want to know kubernetes and linux and uh, cloud and uh, code in this and that can you help me right and i always respond with i don't know how to, i don't know how to do that I, i don't know how to how can a human being start with such a broad scope that should be converted into experience i don't think they can to be honest that's too broad probably the easiest path if you was a developer and interested in doing something other more infrastructure related that's probably the easiest career path that you are already in IT you can switch jobs you can switch company you have to accept some kind of downgrade in your level even if it's not on paper but actually you will be probably no less than the others but my experience is that most of my managers were supportive when we wanted to kind of broaden the scope or the possibilities that was kind of imagined for the team so if they wanted to have a good idea and wanted to execute on that then i think most of the time it can happen easily so that's my point that you have to sell your idea not doesn't matter where you are if you cannot do that then probably the biggest benefit you can do is to invest in your communication skills and learn powerpoint maybe well all of autumn's contact information will be down in the episode description autumn did i get your name right finally almost it's too close <sighs> too close autumn yeah it's like ah uh, like like when you have something uh, <sighs> okay decent to drink and you enjoy it very much <sighs> got it okay anyway thanks for being on the show today thanks for having me on the show We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com/contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcast, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox.